Hey, we're in this series, Life Hacks, and uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. The messages have been full of good, practical, relevant content that I've been applying to my life. I hope you have been as well. And as a bonus, just for fun, just because we can, each week we've been sharing with you just a couple of little practical tips. You know, a life hack is any advice, whatever it has to do with, a life hack is any advice, shortcut, tip, or skill that will help you get things done more efficiently and effectively. Take, for instance, one of these. Maybe you bought one at the store before. You can get these ice packs, and uh, the nice thing about them, as opposed to just water that you would put in a bag and freeze, which would be really hard like a rock, these stay flexible even when they're perfectly frozen. And uh, you can buy these and pay, you know, big bucks for them, or you can do what I did last night. You can take a Ziploc bag, get out your one cup measuring cup, some rubbing alcohol, put two cups of water and one cup of rubbing alcohol in there, freeze it up, and it looks like this, and it does the exact same thing. It stays flexible, and it costs you pennies. There you go. No extra charge for that. That's a great life hack. And here's another way you can save money. Some of you pay those big cable bills or those satellite service bills so that you can watch TV. What you may or may not realize is that right now as we're sitting here, there are over 30 digital channels being broadcast for free all over the Spokane area. And to access them, all you need is one of these. This is a paper clip. Take your TV, change it to TV, take this and put it in the hole where the coaxial cable would normally go in and you get digital TV for free, 30 channels. We shared this with somebody, and they said, isn't that stealing? No, they broadcast it so that you can pick it up. You don't even need an antenna. And then when uh, you need to get back to something else, you do what I need to do right now and switch it back just like that. No extra charge for that. Save you on those monthly satellite bills. Well, a life hack is any advice, shortcut, or tip that makes life better, makes life more efficient, more effective. It's a shortcut. It's a money saver. It's um, a thing that helps make life more enjoyable. And in my opinion, the original giver of life hacks, the original originator of life hacks is none other than the Lord Jesus himself. He, in John chapter 10, declared this about his purpose for coming. He said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Another translation says to have it ri- a rich and satisfying life, a full life, a purposeful life, a life that is, is filled with the meaning that comes from a personal relationship with Christ. And Jesus say, is saying, that's why I came. And, and, and here's who I am. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. See, what I understand from that and many other places in God's word like that is that Jesus is for me. He's not against me that he wants good things for me, that he came so that my life would be full of meaning and purpose, that it would be a satisfying, rewarding life that is centered on a relationship with him. And as a good shepherd, he's going to do everything he can to bring me into that, which is his purpose for my life. And he has done that in my life. I spent 19 years of my life not living for him, not really paying any attention to who he is or might want to be in my life or any purpose he might have had for my life. And uh, he was wooing me, and he got my attention. At age 19, I said yes to him, invited him into my life, and, and, uh, and began to discover what I'm continuing to discover in this journey that's now spanned four decades, that he is, in fact, a good shepherd who wants good things. He wants Craig's life to be full. He wants Craig's life to be meaningful and purposeful, and he wants yours to be the same. If you're one of our guests here today, if you're new to Mirby Chapel, if it's your first time perhaps, or you've been coming a little while and you're trying to figure out what this whole thing is, we talk about being a Christ follower, having an enjoyable relationship with Jesus, we, we talk about believing in Him, what, what does that really mean for you personally? Today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a shortcut that's really not a shortcut, it's actually the only way. It's not just a shorter, more efficient, more effective way, it is the only way to have a relationship with Christ and to help, help us kind of get into um, the, 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 the thought process that I want us to go down today. Let me just start with a story, uh, something that happened this last week. It was Wednesday night. My wife and I were on our way to our small group, community group, and uh, we showed up in two separate cars, and, which is not unusual for us. We're often going different directions, and I parked on one side of the street, and she parked on the other, and 
She got out of her car, locked it, had the key fob in her hand, walked across the street to my truck, and I was at the driver's side getting the crock pot out that was our snack that we were bringing to group that night. And uh, as I was fiddling with it, I set my keys on the console, and she walked over and she said, let me help you. And uh, she said, as a matter of fact, I don't need to carry my keys around. I'll just throw them in your truck. So she did. She put hers in the console, and I grabbed the crock pot, and she said, let me help you. And she hit the lock button on the inside of the driver's door and shut it. <laughs> and I was so appreciative of her help because I completely <laughs> had no idea what was going on because I was carrying a crock pot. And so we get in the house, and we get all situated, and I start feeling around for my keys, and I realize, you know that sinking feeling that just, when the dawn of realization hits you, you, you know how that feels. It's just like, oh, man. Because I knew just in a, a moment of time that not only were my keys locked inside my truck, so were my wife's keys. And when group was over, neither one of us was going to be able to leave. <laughs> so it's like, what do I do? Well, I have a good friend. He's a locksmith, goes to church here. I said, hey, can you help out? He said, well, I'm busy at youth group. I'm one of the volunteers. Yeah, when you get done, could you come? Yep, I'll be right over. So uh, we did our group, and uh, people were starting to leave, and uh, my friend showed up, and so we went out to the truck. And I'm thinking this is pretty easy because, you know, he has all this experience, and he, he opened up tool chests, you know, just full of stuff. And he had gizmos and gadgets and wedges and airbag bladder thingies that you inflate that open the crack around the door even though it's locked. And... And these wires that go in under the glass and, you know, activate stuff. And it's like, made me a little nervous. I was glad he was a man of character because with all those things in there, he could have really had a crime, a life of crime, I'm pretty sure. But anyway, he had all these gadgets and gizmos. And he started walking me through it. He said, you know, back in the day, we'd just take a Slim Jim and open that. But he said, that doesn't work anymore with electric locks. And I said, yeah, I get that. And I, you know, had some experiences with electric locks. And he said, yeah, what we do typically is we'll, we'll get in there and we'll just activate the, the lock. Just push on the button from the inside. Or on the key fob, where's that? Well, it's sitting right there. And, I, and then we looked in through the glass, and there, there the key fob was. And it was just staring back at me. <laughs> As if it was just saying, neener, neener, neener. <laughs> like, very irritating, you know. I just, it's like, if the key fob was a person, I, I was building up inside with resentment toward it. it it's just... But there it was, in doing us no good. So he said, well, not a problem. He says, let, let me see what I can do. And so he gets a crack in the door, and he gets the key or the, the wire in there and grabs a hold of the key ring, and he's fiddling with it. He says, if I can get it face up, I can just push the unlock, and we'll be good. And I keep thinking, any second now he's going to get it. And as he's fiddling with it, it flips between the seat and the console and goes down the crack. Oh. Not a worry, he said, let's just do the door panel. We'll just hit the unlock. And so he got, let me just fast forward an hour later. We'd pushed on the unlock button repeatedly. We could push on the lock, and it would activate, but on the unlock, nothing would happen. Went around the other door, pried it open. By this time, we have all these tools stuck in underneath the glass and inside of my truck, all these weird-shaped wires that, that are tools to design, you know, that are designed to, to break into people's cars. It's like, what's that about? But anyway, so I have all these, and, and you can't take them out unless you get the car unlocked and get inside, and so it's like... Okay, any minute now we'll get it. And we're, we gave up on one side and we're on the other side. And finally we concluded that the way that the locks are programmed, that you can't unlock it with the unlock switch from the inside. You have to have a key fob in your hand. Now, while we're doing all this, my wife is like, I'm out of here. And she gets a ride with some friends and goes home <laughs> to get the other set of keys. Yeah, you saw that coming, didn't you? Because we have a spare set for both vehicles, and she's going to come back. But it's a half an hour each way, so that's an hour round trip. Surely we'll have this open in five minutes. And Well, we didn't. And so right before she came back with the keys, we gave up. We just concluded it just, you can't do it without a key fob because it's just the way that, I mean, because we did everything possible, and, and the key fob that was inside wasn't accessible. So, let, like, let's just wait till she gets here. And we kind of threw our hands up and said, you know, it's too bad. It's not like it was back in the day. You remember when locks were old school before, power locks, and you could just grab it with your thumb and finger and pull up, or, or you could just put your finger underneath the edge of it and just flip it up because it had a, a little ridge right there, and you just push the lock up. You know, kind of like, like that one right there. Like, is that? My locks have a little ridge. 
Yeah, what, what if we just, and he took a tool, and in 20 seconds, he manually pulled up the lock and unlocked the truck. Are you kidding me? An hour of trying every electronic sort of approach and, and every configuration of, of break into people's cars kinds of tools and, and wedges and my doors were all wedged out and it's just like, and I'm sweaty and tired and frustrated and the day's been really long and it's like, are you kidding me? In 20 seconds we did that? Why didn't we try that first? As it turns out, the thing we were doing the hard way, the electronic approach, wasn't going to work anyway. And the thing that did work was the simple thing that we overlooked in the beginning because we were sure it must be harder than it actually was. And it's the same way when it comes to a relationship with God. We overlook the simple and make it harder than it is, and we set ourselves up for not just an hour of hard work and frustration and failure, but sometimes a lifetime when the simple and the easy is actually the thing that really works. We're going to talk today about the grace of God. And for some who aren't familiar with the term, we're not just talking about God being kind. We're talking about God's grace in a biblical sense, which means it includes his mercy. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. When you show mercy, that's what you're saying. You deserve this, but I'm not going to do that. But it's so much more than that. It's God giving us what we don't deserve, a privileged relationship with him. Through being born again, through our faith in Jesus Christ, we're welcomed into the family of God. Be clear, we're all God's children by creation, but not everyone is God's child until they're born again through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you're one of our guests here today, if you're new, I just want you to see how simple this is. This isn't, a, this isn't just a life hack, it's an eternal life hack. It's a shortcut, which is, in fact, the only way to eternal life. It's the only way to have a relationship with Christ, and it comes as a result of the grace of God, which is God in his generosity, in his love and kindness for us, in his mercy, giving to us a gift that we don't deserve, have not earned, and could never qualify for. He gives us the free gift of eternal life, and a forever relationship with him. And I, I, I just, I know, how, I know how we're hardwired because I know my own experience. I've been at this for a long time, and in the last few years, my understanding of the simplicity and yet at the same time the profound nature of God's grace has taken on some new dimensions that were not there before. I thought I understood his grace well, and not that I didn't understand it, but there were some things that were not clear. And in the last two or three or four years, I've been on this journey that has, uh, been every, has everything to do with my relationship with Jesus. And so it's had a lot to do with the kinds of things that I teach and preach. And, and so today we're going to visit this subject again, in part because I know from my experience and my observation of others that, that no matter where we're at in our understanding of God's grace, there's another layer there's another dimension, there's more clarity, there's a, an understanding of it that God wants to bring to each of our hearts that's even more simple and in its simplicity even more profound than maybe what you even expect. So uh, let's invite him, shall we, to be our teacher? Would you do that? Would you join me? Father, in Jesus' name, we just invite your spirit to lead us into truth. Lord, as we consider what your word says, as we... Lord, as we, as we calm our hearts and still our minds and, and open up our minds to you, we invite you to, to shine the light of truth into our hearts, to open up our minds with simplicity and clarity regarding what you've already done for us and what we no longer need to strive or try to do. 
Help us to see what you're offering us and the simplicity of not only receiving it, but walking in it, living by it, communicating it, and giving it away to others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to start in God's Word today in the book of Galatians, and we're going to sample a few verses, and I'm going to encourage you to read the book of Galatians on your own, and I want to encourage you to read it in a modern English translation, maybe a couple of different translations, and, and read it until it makes good sense to you, and, and if you have questions, um, by, by all means, reach out for some help to people that you know or or go online and, and tap some of the resources there. But, but make it, as a student of God's word, make it a, a goal of yours to, to understand what God's wanting to say. Because in this book is the truth that I'm going to summarize for us here today. That is, in fact, um, the ultimate life hack. It's actually that eternal life hack. And it, in Galatians chapter 2, we have Paul the apostle, that one of the leaders of the early church. He's writing to believers in the region of Galatia. And, and he's talking about a time when he was with them. And he's trying to bring them back to a simple understanding of the profound truth concerning God's grace. And the reason he's writing is because he's heard that they've complicated it. Now he knows it was clear and simple in their minds, but, but now they've added some things and they've gotten some other input and they've gotten confused and now the water's muddy. And he's writing to clarify, to simplify, and to, to get them back on track. So... Here's what he says. He says this in Galatians chapter 2. He says, We know that a person is made right with God by faith. Not by works, not by good things you do, not by something you earn or deserve, but by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And by the law he's referring, in this case, to the Old Testament law, not only the Ten Commandments, but the hundreds of other commandments that go along with it. And he's saying, if you try to observe all those and do so perfectly, in, in the attempt to um, achieve acceptability with God, in order to make yourself right with God, uh, good luck with that. You're doomed to fail. That's not going to work. And that's not how our relationship with God came about. It came about by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ. Not because we've obeyed the law. For no one, and, and I, I hope you get this, no one, not you, not me, not anyone's alive today, not anyone who's ever lived or will live, no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. I talk with people regularly, and maybe you're one who would, would answer this question that way. And I ask them, I say, so what does it take to be right with God? What does it mean to have a relationship with God? And they say, well, you know, try harder to be kind and do right and keep the Ten Commandments, stuff like that. And I say, no, wrong. Because if that's the approach you take, you will be, like everyone else, unable to be made right with God. It will not work because it requires perfection. And there are no perfect people on this planet, never have been, with the exception of Jesus Christ. And you're not going to be the first. And Paul, Paul here, in the midst of this presentation, in, in this second chapter, these verses, is, is championing a message for which he's been persecuted. He's taken a lot of heat because he refuses to take the simplicity of the grace of God and allow it to be complicated or the, the profound truth of it um, obscured by law keeping, by rule keeping, by, by, by systems of religious activity that are designed by people to, to, to somehow result in people being made acceptable in the sight of God. And, and it could be the Old Testament law, or it could be something else. For, for a lot of us in this world today, the, the law that's being referred to here might be just the sit, set of rules and regulations, the system that a particular denomination or a religion or a philosophical movement has come up with. And they've said to you, if you follow these rules, if you do these things and don't do these other things, you'll be good to go. You'll get approval. You'll be right with God. You'll be right with the universe or whatever they say. And they reduce it down to rules and regulations. And he's saying no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. Not God's law or any other law made up by men. It doesn't work that way. It's like trying to get the locks unlocked inside the truck 
using the electronic approach when there's a simpler and effective approach that actually is so simple you're overlooking it. Pull up on the little lock. Now, as he's making this point, he goes on a few verses later and he says something that we really need to understand. He says, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. And then he explains himself. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. If you can keep the Ten Commandments and the hundreds of other laws and get a, a seal of approval from God, if you can get a A plus on your final exam, if you can get his approval because you obeyed, then Jesus doesn't need to die. It's possible to do it through self-effort, through human good works and effort. But nobody ever did and nobody ever will, and God knew that that would be the case, and so he sent his son saying, listen, I, I get it. I know that none of you is going to be able to keep the law perfectly. That would require something that's not present in your character, so I'll send my son, and he'll do it for you, and then by faith in him, you'll receive and enter into his righteousness. And that's why Jesus had to die. Now, he's basically saying, if you're setting out to try and do it on your own, you're taking the fact that Jesus died and making it into something meaningless. It's an insult, in other words, to the purpose of God for, for which he sent his son in the first place. Now, at this point, if you read the totality of Galatians, you realize he's pretty fired up, and it's real evident with this next verse. Watch. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. And he says, I'm saying that because I was there and I painted that picture for you and I know you got it. It was clear and simple. It's like he died on the cross because through the keeping of the law, nobody's going to successfully gain approval in God's sight. And so through his sacrifice, we give we get that imparted to us. It's given to us as a free gift. We get the privilege of entering into what he did because we couldn't do it. That's awesome. And they had that so clear in their minds when he was there. And then he hears that that's no longer the case, that it's gotten muddy and confused, maybe like it has for you currently. Something maybe that was clear at one point. Maybe it was never clear and it's coming into clarity now. But it's so important that we keep it clear. And so he's trying to help them get it back in focus. He goes on. He says, let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. And what he's talking about is, were you born again? See, when you're, when you're born again, when you express faith in Christ, when you say, yes, Jesus, I, I want you in my life, he by his spirit, through, as a result of your faith, through the, the Spirit of God, Jesus comes and indwells you. He lives inside of you. And Paul is referring to that, and he's saying, when you got saved, when you gave your hearts to Christ, when the Spirit of God came in, did that happen because you were good? Because you were religious? Because you tried hard? No. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? This baffles me why sincere, honest, church-going people who, who understand that it's God's grace, it's a gift, that when they come to Christ, they don't deserve it, they haven't earned it, and God just gets in there just so thankful and say, yes, God, I'm so glad you're in my life. And then they start trying to add something to the finished work that Jesus has already done as if somehow they can add to it, and they can't. You... If you're acceptable in God's sight, you're as acceptable as you will ever be. You can't do anything to add even one teensy, weensy little bit to the stature that you have in his sight because it's all a free gift in the first place. Yeah, but if I, if I give a little more generously, if I pray a little harder, if I go to more meetings, if I do more for people in need, then maybe, no, no. That doesn't add. You say, well, wait a minute, aren't those things important? Yes, but they don't add anything to your stature in his sight. Look at it this way. I, I, I was with somebody the other day, and um, there, there were a number of us that were eating, and um, the, the bill came. I was planning on paying for mine, 
One of the guys says, I'll just, I'll pay the whole thing. And it's like, oh, really? Are you sure? No, because I'm thinking, yeah, this wasn't a cheap meal, and it was pretty spendy. And he's like, no, I'll pay for the whole thing. And it's like, are you sure? He says, yeah, I got it. And I said, well, at least let me leave a tip. You ever said that, right? Now, when I say that, it's in part because I feel bad because they're picking up the whole tab, and I know how much it is. It's like, it's a lot. It's like, ah, I need to carry my own weight here a little bit. I need to be a responsible person here. I need to show good faith. Like, I'm not a freeloader, you know? I'm not just like, oh, yeah, I left my wallet in the other pants. You know, it's like, well, maybe I'll get it next time. No. So I'm going to leave a tip, right? And, and, it, and we do that with God. It's like, I know, Jesus, you paid the price for my sin. You, you did everything that was necessary for me to have a right relationship with God, but let me leave a tip. Can I do that at least? Can I leave a tip? And it's like, no, you can't leave a tip. I paid the whole price and the tip. There's nothing left for you to do. Just say thank you. Okay, but see, here's the problem. We're hardwired to earn stuff in life, to work hard. Because in every other area of our life, that's how it works. You go to school, do your homework, study for the test, get a good grade, you're promoted to the next class, you go to college, it works the same way. In the work environment, we're rewarded for good effort. There's nothing wrong with that, but the problem is when it comes to God's kingdom, it's the exact opposite, and it's completely um, contrary. I mean, it's just, it's so against our DNA, it just rubs us the wrong way that, that, that somehow God would operate like that. And the simplicity of it is hard for us to wrap our minds around because everything else works the other way. So, so you're thinking, well, wait a minute now, shouldn't I like steer away from sin and, and shouldn't I do good things and help people and be kind and, and shouldn't I serve and, and, and isn't it a good thing to pray? Yeah, absolutely. Those things are all great things to do if you're living from grace, not for it. See, I'm not talking about what you do. I'm talking about why those things are done. If I'm doing those things because I somehow think that's going to add a little bit to my acceptability in God's sight, if I'm somehow, in my mind, raising myself up the totem pole or adding a few notches to my standing in his sight, th then I don't get it. Let me illustrate. So, so not long ago, I shared the story about a time when I just, I lied. I lied right through my teeth, and I told some of the details of that story, and in, in a gathering, and, and when, when I lied, I realized, okay, that was a sin. Not a white lie, it wasn't a fudging of the truth, it was just a sin, right? So, so I'm being honest with myself and honest with God, and it's like, so now, in that moment, what I decide to do is what we're talking about here right now. I, I've fallen on my face, right? Spiritually and morally, I'm, I'm face down in the mud of my own poor decision. You with me? So now what I can choose to do at that point is I can say, all right, I already messed it up again, and I'm so embarrassed and I'm so ashamed, so I'm going to do these four things to make it right and to kind of compensate for my bad decision, and maybe I'll add a few more just for good measure, and hopefully God's frown will go to a smile again when it comes to me. And that kind of thinking fails to understand the simple and profound truth of the grace of God. Because none of that has anything to do with God's grace. God's grace says that because of Jesus, my posture towards you is a smile. Because of Jesus, I'm for you and not against you. Because of Jesus, you have my righteousness. You don't have to strive to develop your own. Live from what I've done for you. Live from what I've given to you. Live from the understanding that I've already taken care of the bill and the tip that you don't have to do anything more because you couldn't possibly elevate yourself in my sight any more than you already are. I call you my child, I call you my son, and you're good to go. Now live from an understanding of that. And when that grips my heart, you know what I want to do? I want to live right. I want to say no to sin. I want to do the kind thing and the loving thing and the, and the wonderful thing and the, and the helpful thing. And I want to serve and be the person that, that, that makes a difference for Jesus. Why? Because I'm living from his grace, not for it. And there's a powerful difference there. Powerful difference. Now, if you're new to our church, maybe you weren't around at the beginning of the year, so you missed out on an emphasis that we did called 40 Days of Grace. And if you were around and you did participate in that, I want to encourage you to give it another go. I'm inviting all of you to do what I'm going to do, and that is to do the 40 Days of Grace again on your own. 
It's a daily email for 40 days. It's a short devotional that'll come to your email. You can go to 40daysofgrace.com and sign up for it even right now if you want. And what will happen when you get that email is you'll get a, a scripture, a short devotional thought, and an action step, something to think about or do during the course of the day that will help to deepen your understanding of grace and how God's relationship with you is meant to function. So uh, take advantage of that if you would. But by all means, if you're here today and you've never said yes to, to receive God's grace, the first thing I'd encourage you to do before you even leave here today is receive it. Say yes. I mean, if I was handing out free donuts, wouldn't you say yes? Well, no, I'm kind of, you know, watching my weight. All right, if I was handing out free $50 bills, wouldn't you say yes to one of those? Well, no, not unless it was 100 Well, if I was offering $100 bills. Some of you are a hard sell here. I'm doing what I can here. My point is, it's free. He paid for it. Receive it. Receive God's grace. Receive his offer of forgiveness. Receive his offer of a purposeful life. Receive his offer of a personal relationship with him. He's just inviting you to follow him. I'm not asking you, and he's not asking you to join this church or be religious or try harder or do your best. He's just saying, will you believe in me and follow me? Receive my grace? Will I paid it for you. Won't you say yes to it? And if you haven't said yes to the grace of God, if you haven't said yes to Jesus, you can do so in the same way I did, with a simple but sincere prayer in an environment like this. And I'm going to lead you in that prayer right now. This is your moment. It's like, well, I've got to get prepared. No, there's nothing you can do to prepare. You just come right as you are with all your questions and confusion and uncertainty and doubts and just come to him. And he says, I'll take you just like you are. I love you just like you are. And I'm inviting you into a relationship with me. Now, I'm going to invite you to pray that prayer by repeating it phrase, after, phrase by phrase after me in a whisper that you can hear. And I'm going to invite everybody sitting around you to join you as we pray this together. And let's receive his grace. You ready? Let's do it. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and for your son Jesus. Jesus, thank you that you paid it all. I open my heart, I open my life, I invite you in. I accept your free gift. I accept your forgiveness. I accept your grace. Please show me who you really are and what it really means to live from your grace, not for it. I pray in your name, the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer and you meant it, and maybe, maybe for you it was just a way to settle all doubt, like drive a stake that marks a, a, a definitive moment in your life when you say yes to Jesus, or maybe, maybe you've never prayed something like that ever before and, and it's all brand new to you. Let me welcome you if you were sincere, then God, by his spirit, came to indwell you just now, and he took you at your word, and he is eager to develop a personal relationship with you as you follow him. And I would just like to say, welcome to the family of God. And if there are anything, if there is anything that we can do to help you, we'd love to do that. And if nothing else, before you leave today, grab one of these yes packets. They're available out at guest services near the exit doors in the lobby on your way out. They're free to you and inside are some things that will help you have a great relationship with the Lord. But for all of us here today, whether we just received his grace or like me who received his grace years ago, let's also do this. Let's embrace it. And by that I mean let's just hug it. Let's full on embrace it. Let's grab a hold of it and not let go of it. Let's refuse to allow it to be muddied or or confused or obscured by rules and regulations and, and do's and don'ts and law keeping and all kinds of other notions and ideas that get in the way of the simple but profound truth that it is by God's grace that I am a child of God. And then third and final, and this is something all of us can do, let's give it. I mean, how, how, how unfair is it of us to receive freely God's grace and then turn around and be stingy with it when it comes to other people? 
In other words, that person at work, that person you're sitting next to, that person on the platform who's talking to you right now, that, that person that lives under the same roof you do, that person that lives next door, that person across the room that, that, that you need to extend grace to because they need the grace from you that only you can get to them, be, be generous, not stingy. Be liberal. Give it freely. Why? Because God gives his grace freely to you. Receive it. Embrace it. Give it. It's a life hack. It'll make your relationship with God work. It'll make your life better as you walk with him, and it'll make your relationships with other people better as well. Let's pray. Father.